Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to our Start UG session on preparing for university academics. We're really excited to have you folks all here with us. Uh, my name is Jenny, and I am a member of the Start team who is here helping you prepare this summer uh, for coming to U of G for the fall. Um, we're really excited today to help chat with you about preparing for university academics. Whether you're coming directly from high school, you've taken some time off between uh, high school, or you're coming from another post-secondary institution, we are excited to welcome you today. Uh, so before I begin, I'd like to get started with a land acknowledgement. Um, so it is with great respect that the START team acknowledges that the University of Guelph resides on the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe and the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We do recognize that today this is a gathering place and home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, and acknowledging them reminds us of our relationships to this land where we will all learn and grow. So as a new Griffin, it's incredibly important to understand the land acknowledgements and why we do them here at U of G. So we'll post a link in the chat, but we encourage you to visit the University of Guelph's land acknowledgement website to learn more about uh, what land acknowledgements mean to us at the University of Guelph. And I encourage you all to watch the beautiful uh, video that has been produced on the website as well. So it's hard to believe that in a few short weeks, you folks will be joining us uh, for orientation week and your first day of classes. Uh, that is crazy, but we're so excited and we're getting all geared up to help uh, welcome you folks to U of G. Uh, your first day of classes is going to be the Thursday, so Thursday, September 7th. And our session today is going to really help you kind of uh, have some notes and reminders about um, things to keep in mind for your first day of classes. Uh, today we have some wonderful special guests to chat with you about starting to think about your university academics and how you can prepare yourself over the next few weeks. We have some wonderful students who are going to talk to you about creating schedules and buying textbooks and supplies. We have Shelly Ann uh, who is here and she is a wonderful professor on campus and she's going to provide you with some pointers from a professor's perspective. And then we also have Heather from the library to talk about all the wonderful academic supports on campus. But first, before we go through and welcome some of our special guests, um, let's talk about some of the differences for those of you coming straight from high school uh, to U of G. So there are quite a few differences between high school and university learning. So in high school, you may be used to your schedules running from you know, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. roughly. Every day looks sort of similar. You're operating within those same time frames. Uh, and you also tend to be evaluated more frequently with shorter assignments. Uh, some of you may be used to doing like summative assignments uh, at the end of your semester, uh, and that is something that will continue in university as well. You may also experience some smaller class sizes in high school, and you'll have lots of in-class time, and perhaps you even have some time when you're in the class to do some of your project work. In university, your day will look a little bit different. Uh, so your class times may differ from day to day. So as you'll see Josh speaking about later, maybe you have a early morning, 8.30 to 10 a.m. class in the morning. Then maybe you have a large block of time where you're free um, before you have an evening class starting at 7 p.m. Uh, some students also don't have, they have a day during the week without any class at all. Um, and it can be quite tempting to go through and say, perfect, I have a big chunk of time. Let me walk over to the mall or let me go see a movie. And while self-care and enjoying yourself is important, um, it's important to remember that um, for every hour of class that you're in, they suggest about you're doing about two to three hours of work outside of that classroom. The reason is uh, because in university, you will have fewer assignments that are worth more. So uh, it does depend on how the professor structures their classes, but you might be having, you know, one big paper or one big kind of final lab and then a, a final exam at the end of the course. And that's how you're evaluated. 
Um, so it's the expectation and the onus is now on you to make sure that you're doing the readings, doing the practice questions that are assigned to you uh, outside of that class time. So uh, usually when you will see when we talk about our schedule and different types of classes, you'll be assigned a lecture or a seminar. And the expectation is that's really the time where the professor is conveying the information to you. A lot of times you won't have time to you know, work on your assignment during that actual class and you're expected to fit in that actual you know, project work within that schedule, within the chunks of time that you have in between classes. But you can see more about that um, when we hear from Shelly Ann and Josh who talk about scheduling. Um, there's also a lot more independence in university. Uh, it's very exciting and um, the learning styles really do change. Um, it is a lot of, it's very exciting to have that independence to be able to, you know, do with your own time what you wish. Um, but also does require a little bit of discipline and really planning your time effectively um, because unlike high school, there's not really someone looking over your shoulder to make sure you're getting things in on time um, because you're going to be in a lot larger class. Some of our classes, especially in first year, some of the bigger courses are 300, 400 students. So your professor doesn't have the ability to go in and make sure that each of you has submitted your assignment on time. Unlike when you're in a high school class where there's 30 students and your professor can kind of check on you individually. So it's up to you to make sure that you are maintaining a schedule, aware of your deadlines and getting your assignments um, completed. That being said, there's plenty of different resources on campus to help you with assignments, to help you with time management, and you'll hear more about those from Heather later on in the session. And lastly, um, in university, our uh, semesters are a lot shorter. So we have the fall semester, which uh, runs from September to December, um, and then we have an exam period in December. And then we have our winter semester, which runs from uh, January until April. So if you choose, uh, our summer semester actually is four months. So May, June, July, and August. Some students choose to take summer classes. Other students choose to work or, you know, do an extracurricular experience. Um, so you'll notice that after you've completed your first year of university, that first summer might feel a little bit long for you, especially if you're only used to the two semester summer um, from high school. So now that we've kind of chatted about some of the differences, uh, you'll also notice that there's different types of classes um, and these are indicated on your uh, class schedule on WebAdvisor. So you have four different types of classes roughly. We have lecture, seminar, lab, and then a distance education class. A lecture, so this is a picture on the screen of one of the lecture halls in Rosansky, um, but a lecture is typically the spot where your professor lectures or where your professor will give you all the different information um, on your course content. Um, some professors um, in different lecture sty styles vary. Um, some lecture styles do vary. Um, oh, I think we're just running into some technical difficulties. There we go. Awesome. Um, so some lecture styles, like I said, do vary um, and professors really do get to have their moment to shine in the lecture, get to uh, tell you all about their great research, all about the topics that they're very passionate about. And this is where you will get a lot of your information. Um, this is your main way that you will get the information for the course. So it's really important that you're attending your lectures. Um, we also have what's called seminars. You may also hear them referred to as discussion groups and um, other um, institutions, but these are smaller groups. So where a lecture might be up to 300 people, a seminar is usually about a smaller group, more around a class, like a high school class size, about 30 students, um, where you will discuss what happened in lecture. Um, a lot of times these are run by teaching assistants, so a upper year student who's taken the class um, and who is assigned to a professor to help mark, um, and they will run you through different exercises, uh, they might have discussion questions for you to chat about as well. Seminars are more frequently found in like arts and social science classes um, as well. 
Then we have labs. So labs are usually found in more of the science-based courses um, or engineering. And these are uh, can be held in technical labs, science labs. Um, and again, there are smaller sections where you will apply the knowledge that you learned in the lecture. So this can take place of like lab assignments, running tests, experiments. Um, and again, they're usually led by a TA. Um, and it's a both a seminar and labs are a great way for you to engage with the content a little bit more deeply, but also kind of ask and get a better understanding of material and the projects and assignments uh, that you have for your course. And then lastly, we have distance education classes. So distance education classes, or you might see in parentheses like a DE on your class schedule. Distance education really is um, about um, is really about uh, taking your courses online. So these courses tend to be virtual based options. Not every class is offered in the distance education format, but some courses are. Uh, these courses rely heavily on using our course link platform, which is where you can go and find information um, about your courses. And they might be a variety of um, different videos. They might have lectures that you attend in real time, but they're held on Teams or Zoom. Um, and if you are in a distance education class, uh, you'll notice again that it mentions that on course link. So this just means that your class is virtual. And if you do have different um, uh, questions about being in a distance education class or a different type of class, feel free to send us an email or post a question in the chat and we can help you um, get those questions answered. But now it is my pleasure to uh, welcome Shellyann Hardiel, who is a wonderful professor here on uh, campus, and we're very delighted to have her here to share some of her tips and tricks with you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jenny. And it's my pleasure to be here to share with all of you some tips for academic success. And um, for this brief segment, what we're going to focus on um, are a few bullet points here, but I'll definitely give you some context. And the first thing you want to get very familiar with is your syllabus. Another word for that is your course outline. And honestly, you want this document to become your best friend. Um, it's important because this is where you're going to be finding dates, deadlines, you know, the list for your assigned readings. This is where you're going to find your textbooks or find the contact for your professor or your teaching assistant who may be responsible for grading your assignments. And you'll also find assignment instructions and so on. So it's important that you make time to read your syllabus in detail, even if the professor has discussed the course outline during your first lecture because usually um, when you begin your courses the tendency is there for the professor to you know make some time for you to go through the course outline but i am imploring you make time to go in detail after um, as well. Some of the questions that are asked in lectures about assignment deadlines or assigned readings most time can be found in the syllabus and so try to avoid asking questions that can be answered by the syllabus, right? Because it, 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 it shows you up in a way where it's like, did you take the time to read the syllabus? So that's why I always encourage students read the syllabus um, first and if you have any questions or if there are any concerns that you don't see uh, covered in that syllabus, then of course, feel free to reach out to your professor and to your teaching assistant for clarification. So it's not that you can't ask any question. I would say take the time, make the time, read it. And then if you need clarification or if you need um, further answers, then by all means, follow up with the respective professor and TA. So, and you're going to hear me refer to TA and what that is. It's just a shortened form of me saying your teaching assistant. 
All right. Um, another thing too, with your course outline, you want to highlight your due dates. I find that to be very helpful for students and even for me as I was going through my academic years up to completing my PhD. So you want to highlight your due dates and create realistic timelines for completing assignments. So usually like the first day of class, you might have some room. Some professors may just focus on working through the syllabus and leaving you with time to further pay attention to due dates and this is where you want to highlight the due dates and take the time to create a realistic timeline on how you're going to be you know completing your readings how you're going to be completing the assignments and even you know based on the time that you have to work with what is the best strategy and timeline for reviewing your notes to be successful for your assessment pieces so that could be your quiz your midterm your exams the other thing that we want to look at for being academically you know, successful is being mindfully present versus being absent mentally. All right, and this is a key component to your academic success in that when you're in lectures, you know, once you're well, once you're well in terms of you're physically well, you're able to go to class, you're, you're mentally um, well, because I know sometimes there can be challenges around being overwhelmed, etc. So do take what I'm saying in context that once you are well, show up for your lectures, show up, show up for yourself because that's what you're doing and that's important. It's key for your academic success. And so when you show up for yourself, it actually helps with your note taking. And I want to encourage you, learn in the moment. Learn in the moment and understand the concept before you start jotting down your notes, because in doing so, you'll be able to paraphrase and you're able to remember the content better, as well as do exceptionally well when it's time to do your exams. So avoid trying to write everything down all at once, because a lot of times what happens is the professor is teaching and as they're lecturing, some students will try to get everything in word for word. And sometimes by the time you are midway that sentence, the professor has moved on to a whole new paragraph. And so you're left kind of like, oh my goodness, like what was that? And it's not that you can necessarily pause to kind of like think quickly what was said. So it's best to stay engaged, stay present, listen, make sense of what is being taught. And in doing so, you're able to paraphrase that and then write your notes. And believe me when I say when it's time for review, that information will come back so quickly because you understood in that moment. And if you don't understand, there is room where you can ask for clarification. And depending on the, you know, the lectures, depending on what's happening in that moment, you can raise a hand. You can raise a hand to ask for clarification because, again, that is one way in which your professor is getting to know you. And secondly, this is where you're advocating for your own knowledge because you're trying to make sense. And it's not that you're going to be constantly, you know, raising your hand, you know, saying, OK, I need to know this. I need clarification on this. But pause, make sense of what you're hearing. And when you're not sure about something or when you want to dig a little bit deeper, feel free to raise your hand. A lot of professors, they don't mind that at all. Or they'll tell you from the onset of lecture, you know, they'll take questions during or after. So you work, you work with the culture of your um, your class as well. OK, so do do keep that in mind and learn in the moment because that's very important for you. And as I said, avoid trying to jot everything down because honestly, you won't get everything down. Um, the other thing too to keep in mind, if a professor says something more than once, then it's important, right? If you keep hearing that repetition, it means this is something I need to make a note of mentally. And of course, writing it down because it's going to come back up in some type of assessment piece, as well as in your own writing. When you're doing essays for, for some of you who are going to be in the social sciences, for example, when you're doing those essay pieces, you want to have memory of those important um, content, those key content information so you can display your knowledge and not just you remembering but how you're making sense of that information the other thing too with um, being mindfully present um, it helps you 
in terms of making sense of the information. And so you're able to explain, like take the time out, you know, for anyone who cares to listen, whether it's your peer, your roommates, your family members, um, it helps to explain what you've learned from lecture because again, you're, re you're reinforcing that knowledge. So that is definitely a key piece for academic success. So anybody who cares to listen, just be like, you know what? My professor shared this and I you know, read this article and I'm making sense of it like this and, and just engage people. And as I said, for those who care to listen, all right? So we're gonna be mindful. Um, not everybody may be interested in the topics that are quite important to us, but that does help. And um, another thing I want you to keep in mind is to participate participate in class as meaningfully as possible, right? So ask critical questions, practice mindfulness and be respectful. And it's a good way really for your professors and your TAs to get to know you. And the reason I say to participate in meaningful ways, there are times when I find students will ask questions and I'm just like, hmm, you know, we're talking about a particular article and so the student is asking a question that is not so much related to the article or not so much related to the theory, which kind of gives that idea of, you know, are you just asking a question because you want to show that you're participating or are you meaningfully engaging because you've read the article, you're not clear or you are clear and then you're contributing to the conversation. There's a difference because there are times when you will read your textbook, you will be in labs, and you're working through something and you're just not sure about it, you can ask for clarification. And that's that's a beautiful thing. It is a um, analytical piece that you're building for yourself when you read something and you're like, I'm not clear on this or this is not making sense. And when you question that knowledge, it shows your interest and your um, engagement, right? So engage in meaningful ways, right? And not just necessarily bouncing ideas off each other. So in the context of lectures, yes, you're listening to others, but make sure you're making the time to read and to stay actively present in listening so that you are able to contribute meaningfully. All right. So that's that's a key piece as well. It is very difficult to fully participate in class discussions and do well on assessments when you don't engage with the course materials, right? So make that time to read those assigned articles and show up for those online, you know, discussions and be present in your labs. When you become absent minded and tell yourself, OK, I'm going to review the lecture notes after, right? I'm going to review the lecture slides because um, sometimes you do have professors who share those lecture slides with you, but don't take that for granted. Don't show up, but then be mentally absent where it's like, ah, I'm going to look at those slides afterwards because what will happen is you may not remember the most important details about the concepts or the terms that are shared. And additionally, when you delay reading your course content until assessment time, this can actually contribute to overwhelmingness and anxiety. And those two are detrimental factors to you showing up as your best self, right? So this is where I always encourage students, like when you wanna be successful in your courses, show up for yourself, be mentally present, because for that moment when you tune out, that could be a key moment when something is shared. And even though you're telling yourself, I'll go back to it when I'm reviewing, because you weren't present in that moment, it's going to be difficult. And it's not to say you can't read up some more to get clarification, but it helps to be present. So when you show up, be also mentally present. All right, the other um, important piece that I'm going to leave with you is to record lectures, if it's possible, right? You see I have permission there. It's important to find out from your professor. Uh, if recording the lecture is allowed because not all professors may consent to that. OK, so reach out and ask, you know, it's either yes or no. So it's important to, to secure that permission before you begin recording. And if recording is allowed, then that's definitely a helpful piece when it comes on to reviewing your notes. And then on to the next slide, we have 
shared note taking and we have what's called the student accessibility services here at the University of Guelph and when you volunteer with the student accessibility services to be a note taker in your classes. This is not, um, this not only helps with supporting your fellow peer who may have visible or invisible disabilities, but it also helps you with memorizing, summarizing, paraphrasing, and understanding the course content. And honestly, this is a great opportunity that helps you to contribute to an inclusive campus and be academically successful. So it's not just for yourself, but it's also how you can contribute to your um, community, your academic community and be successful at the same time. So that's a key piece that I would encourage you to check out if you're available in terms of, you know, you're in a position where you are able to volunteer to be a note taker, that's definitely a plus for you because it's helping you as well as you're helping out other students as well. Um, we have often hours. I cannot overemphasize how communication is paramount. It can never be understated at all. And so you want to make your professor aware of important occurrences um, that are happening with you. And I find that sometimes students get a bit overwhelmed and they're like, ah, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm not going to, you know, email my professor with what's going on. But let me tell you, we're all human beings. OK, and so, for example, if you've had, you know, a death in your family or a loved one has passed, whether that's a family member or a close friend. And if that's having a severe impact on you, don't be afraid to send an email to your professor to say, this is happening with me. I'm struggling here and work out some type of accommodation because at the end of the day, you want to be successful. And I believe as professors, we want our students to be successful. So it's OK to communicate that as well. Don't don't feel like your back is against the wall. Reach out to your professors and communicate those important occurrences, not you going to party or, you know, doing your own thing and staying up late and then, you know, not able to perform because we didn't get enough rest. I'm not talking about those emails. I'm talking about important occurrences. OK. So keep that, keep that in mind. And I see that my time is going. And so I'm just going to move along um, quickly here. The other thing I want you to keep in mind as well is connect with your professors and your TAs outside of class. Office hours are very, very important. It actually helps you with building rapport and networking with your professors and your TAs. And they love that. We love that. We love to see students outside of office hours because we see that there's an interest. You know, this student has an interest and wants to know more. And sometimes there are opportunities that come up. And because of those connections, you never know. You never know. So make use of your office hours. And again, when you're seeking for clarification, that's a good space to find out, you know, what you need to know. And when it comes on to assignments and the instructions if you're not clear or, you know, when you plan to do your assignment in advance and you need feedback, office hours is a good, good space to make use of. All right. And lastly, independent um, learning. Now, with independent learning, going back to what Jenny says, you're pretty much you are in control. You are in control of your learning. You're in control of your academic success. So you want to engage in critical thinking. And what that means is as you're reading, as you're reviewing, you want to look at the content and, 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 and really get into what is being dis discussed. Um, is there a gap? What needs to be considered? What theories would be applicable in understanding this concept, etc.? Right? Like don't study in isolation. Look at the various courses that you're doing and look at look for pieces of integration, pieces of intersectionalities, because us as professors, we like that too. When you take knowledge from another class and you intersect that with the knowledge you're currently learning in the present class. So that's a key piece, not just for your academic success, but even beyond the campus and um, limit your procrastination. And I have intentional planning there on purpose because at some point, can I tell you, we all procrastinate. 
at some point we all procrastinate. And so I always encourage students to give themselves permission to have a realistic break or procrastination slot, right? So you do the things that you enjoy, you know, whether that's watching a movie, hanging out with um, loved ones. And once that time is up, so you give yourself an hour or two hours of the day to do all of that jazz, right? And then once that time is up, you want to discipline yourselves to concentrate in a space that is distraction free, right as much as possible you want to really just um tunnel into your work because you've had the fun you've procrastinated for a while so now it's time to get to work so it's important that you really um discipline yourself to review your notes focus on completing your assignments um in various stages ahead of the due dates and of course give yourself time to seek for clarification and lastly self-care okay and with that you are the best person to care for yourself. You know your capacity and what your body needs. So ensure you're balancing your academics and taking care of yourself, right? So you need to commit time to rest, eat well, and do the things that you enjoy doing. And moderation is key, right? So when I say rest, we're not sleeping for the entire day now and being like, okay, tomorrow I'll pick it up. No, it's like getting that eight hour in. And then it's like, yes, time to get up and do some work, right? Being realistic. And of course, connect with student groups on campus. There are a lot of student groups, right? Connect with peer programs and take advantage of the athletics department, right? Because social events and exercise, those are all important key pieces for your your well-being. So, you know, if you find that you are struggling with academics and or self-care, reach out to the various university resources for support, such as student experience, student wellness, your academic advisor, library services, you know, whatever it may be. At the end of the day, we are here for you, regardless of the role that we are in, professors, etc. We are here for you. Thank you for your attention and I wish you all the best with your academics and well-being. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Shelley-Ann. So Josh is now going to speak to us a little bit about how to make a schedule as a university student. Hello, um, I think everybody will be able to hear me. My name is Josh. Oh, so there's a drill going on in the back, so I don't know if anybody can hear that. Um, my name is Josh, so a bit about me. I just graduated from a Bachelor of Arts and Science. My minors were in biology and marketing, and I'm also on the orientation team. I think that with the right knowledge going into something like your schedule, you can really hit the ground running and make the most of your time here at U of G. Uh, so I'm gonna chat with you today about scheduling. So now that you've picked your courses, you'll notice that your class schedule looks a little emptier compared to how it looked in high school. Uh, this is where the feeling kicks in kind of like, oh, wow, they really expect us to do all the studying on our own. That's kind of what we talked about earlier in this session as well. Um, the university learning environment is more independent than high school, which means that you spend a lot less time in class. Um, this can be a freeing feeling, but it also means that you have to adjust and make more time for independent learning, coursework and assignments outside of class. Um, I made it a goal to make the most out of my extra time. So to make the most of my university experience, I found that scheduling my time was a must to make sure I got all the necessary things in there. Um, for example, in my first year, I worked part time on campus and I went to the gym regularly and I also uh, made time for assignments and projects and also um, trying to learn about clubs and different things to join in my later years as well. On the screen is an example of my schedule in third year on the left. Uh, with four classes um, because I took one in the summer to try to give myself a lighter course load. Uh, on the right is an example of what your calendar could look like after you add some extracurriculars or some things about your lifestyle in. Um, it may look like a lot, but these extra additions are great at keeping you on track in visualizing your week. So not everything on the calendar on the right is a, a stressful kind of uh, thing to worry about. Some of them can be Frisbee, for example, or going to go sit in the library with some of your friends. So I have a few tips uh, that I'm going to share with drafting a schedule or making a schedule as a university student. So number one, I would say to write on a blank schedule uh, when all your classes are, or also just print out a class schedule and annotate it with some notes. Um, I did that. Um, I found it to be pretty helpful. Um, this can kind of uh, I would annotate it, sorry, with uh, kind of what you need to bring to that class, for example, like a specific textbook or calculator. 
this can help you visualize uh, what you have time or when you have time to fit other things in there as well. Sorry, now there's a hammer going. I don't know if you guys can hear that. Um, for every, this is very conveniently timed. <laughs> for every hour of class you have, um, this is tip number two. I would, so for every hour of class, I would recommend adding another hour on your schedule uh, to do related work or to prepare for it. In my first year, I took Bio 1070. Um, a lot of people will take that class. I love that class. I found that by handwriting notes, I was able to retain more. This has uh, kind of been the case with a lot of science classes that I took. And I found that about two hours, or sorry, for my two hour and a half classes each week, it was really helpful for me to just take an hour uh, in the day uh, before or before the class to just write out the notes prior uh, using the posted slides. Uh, then I just go to the lecture with my pre-written notes and I would just watch and I would just listen and add some notes. Uh, this technique kind of changed my whole studying habit and I found that I was retaining so much more uh, that way uh, when I took notes uh, versus in high school, taking notes how I took notes in high school. Um, it also kind of relieves a lot of the stress that you have in the lecture as well. It's, uh, it feels a lot less frantic. So what if the slides aren't posted? Um, so I had that happen a lot as well when I would try to prepare. I would just go through the textbook pages that are listed in the syllabus and I would briefly just make notes about the defined terms or concepts that each chapter was about. Um, it sounds like it could be kind of boring and kind of hard to self-motivate to do this, but I promise it is very helpful. Um, these things that you will uh, make notes about, they are always going to be on the tests. And um, by taking a couple hours each week to review or prepare for your class, you will feel so much more confident and you'll know the exact questions to ask as well as we were talking about earlier. This is also a great way to hang out and get to know people in your classes or seminars. Uh, so just taking an hour to study in the science complex and then going to switch to the library or the UC um, is a great way to kind of, uh, you know, not be real narrowly focused in one little space because then you leave that space and you kind of find that you forget a lot of things. Um, make a fun afternoon of it as well with people you know. So we would my friends and I would go hang out at the science complex and do two hours of work and then go do something fun. Um, so by testing out a process for reviewing uh, work before your classes, you'll eventually find out what works well for you and what doesn't work well for you. Um, everybody is different and everybody has a different method that will work best for them and that's just a fact. So uh, the more you experiment around with different schedules or different uh, preparation methods, the sooner you'll find what really works best for you. So a third tip I have is that when you're loading up your calendar, um, try not to overburden yourself with expectations. Be realistic and make sure that you remind yourself that you're doing a great job um, for making a plan and sticking to it. So sometimes you have a lot of assignments to work on um, and then you make a plan, you stick to it, but then you think, well, I still didn't do this or I didn't do that, but you still made progress and progress is progress. So make sure you uh, keep that in mind and remember that. Um, number four uh, for the fourth tip is just make time to do things other than school. This is also really important. Um, most people romanticize and kind of talk about the grind and staying up all night and studying and going super hard on one project or one assignment. And I can tell you that from my four years of university, um, this is just a detrimental um, plan and it just does not go well for you the next day because you have two hours of sleep and your, your work that you're doing at 3 a.m. is not your best work, and that's just not what you're going to be proud of. So if I stayed up all night and worked on a project, I definitely felt it the next day because your body just physically is not getting the sleep. It's not getting what it needs um, normally. Um, so that's why making a schedule with a lot of things in moderation, like three hours of studying if you have a lot to do, and then you plan two hours to talk to your friends or play a game or go for a walk or go to the gym, something like that. It will just keep your mind more refreshed and you will be definitely uh, at a higher performance level in terms of school and just uh, feeling better overall. So make sure that you take care of yourself and uh, you will feel like the best version of yourself. Uh, also block out a day after class if you have a few hours or uh, ten, or something uh, that fits well in your schedule to just not even think about school. Um, of course, there are busier times for the semester, but we always know when they're coming up. So you will find all the information in the syllabus. It's all going to be there. You'll be able to figure out when the busier times will be and you'll be able to uh, hopefully acknowledge when the less busier times are to uh, prepare for the busier times. Um, so 
um, make sure you take breaks as well when you're studying. Go and stretch your legs. This is something I like to do a lot. Um, it kind of keeps you on your toes, um, literally and figuratively. Uh, go outside and breathe in some outside air uh, while a friend or someone you trust watches your things for a few minutes. That's something else I would do just to go for a walk. And remember to live your life as well. You're, you're a person and you're a student, so make sure that you're doing the things you enjoy as well. Um, so you can watch a show at the same time every week, or maybe you're interested in joining a club on campus. Having these kinds of things in your schedules uh, helps you keep a work-life balance. Um, and if you're looking for a blank schedule to use, check out the calendar that comes with Microsoft Teams or Outlook. Uh, since you'll be logging into your school email account pretty frequently, Anyway, it's an easy place to keep your schedule. It'll sync if you have the app on your phone and then you'll be able to see it on your computer as well. When you go on your email, even a Google Calendar uh, can sync with your Mac calendar if you have a Mac. Um, that's what I've been using throughout university. It's just been so convenient. Uh, I would recommend getting a planner also um, if you prefer to write things down that has big spaces um, for each day. Uh, we also have wall calendars at the bookstore on campus, which are great for big due dates and important events. Um, pretty much everybody I knew had one of these on their wall and whether they used it or not um, is pretty helpful because you get some different color markers and you can annotate it a little bit. Um, so you can still see that there are some open chunks of time on the calendar there on the left. Those are the weekends. Make sure that you uh, are scheduling time to enjoy your weekends as well um, and to uh, continue living your life. Uh, if this feels like a lot or it seems totally new or a little overwhelming, uh, it's a totally normal feeling and it is definitely going to be challenging at first and just remember that you don't need to figure all of this out at once. Since this is your first time in university or uh, first time with this kind of thing, uh, be kind to yourself and know what stepping in and know that stepping into university is all about trying to new, uh, trying new things and readjusting. Uh, it's a, you'll be doing a lot of adapting. You will get familiar with your calendar uh, you'll need to be on campus and it will be easier to readjust your schedule as needed. Um, I promise you'll definitely be making adjustments. Try talking to your family and friends about how they like to schedule their time. There's a lot of folks around who give us support, uh, so all we have to do is reach out and ask. So that is something I would definitely recommend. Just ask your parents or ask somebody you trust, does this calendar look realistic? Um, they'll uh, give you an honest answer. So uh, yeah, and remember, you know yourself the best, so um, just make a schedule that seems like it works for you. All right, um, so now Heather is going to talk a little bit about learning supports and resources on campus. All right, uh, thanks so much, Josh. Um, yeah, so as Josh says, I'm going to be talking about some key resources. Uh, the main thing to know is that these are all covered in your tuition and all students have access to them. Uh, most of the resources or supports are available in the library. Uh, and for folks registered with SAS, there are um, other sessions that are offered that are specific to those types of learning supports. Uh, but if you have any questions, you can email start at uaguelph.ca and that email address will be popped in the chat right now. Um, all right, so that said, I'm going to talk about services that are for all students. This is every student in every program across all years. Um, the, the slide, oh, sorry, can, can you just go back to the previous slide, Jenny, please? Um, uh, so right here is a picture of our new front door in the library. The library is almost in the center of campus, um, so we're pretty easy to find. Uh, every floor in the library has a different vibe, so check out each each floor, uh, the main floor has the Starbucks. That's where people tend to uh, meet and hang out initially when they come into the library. Some floors are quiet floors. Uh, some floors have study carols, individual study rooms. Um, yeah, so just check them out. I do know of some students who change like floor to floor depending on like maybe they're switching between studying for different courses. So every time they like start at the top and move down, um, but do find out which one is right for you. Uh, OK, so uh, you might have heard and I think Jenny mentioned it really earlier that uh, university is really different from high school uh, and it is. The professor's expectations are different and the amount of content you'll be learning is different. Uh, and that's why we have so many people here to support you uh, in addition to your profs and teaching assistants. 
Uh, I do want to add that if you have any questions about learning as I'm speaking, please, or, or studying, please feel free to pop them in the chat and I will get to them. Um, Josh mentioned the importance of a great study schedule. Uh, here in the library, you can meet with a learning specialist or an academic coach who can help you create one that's right for you. Uh, so Josh was talking about giving a stab at trying one for yourself and then getting some perspective on that. You can bring that into us and we'll ask you some questions about, you know, you know, why are you doing your review here or, you know, what what works for you? And oh, you know, did you did you forget to put in that you do need some social time and that you might not want to start studying at seven o'clock on a Saturday morning? Um, we'll help make sure that your schedule is really realistic. The academic coaches that we have here are current students uh, and they know what's happening on campus and what it's like being a student right now. The learning specialists are staff who are dedicated to supporting uh, anything related to learning. So learning, studying, time management and presentation skills. Um, and as I mentioned before, from first year all the way through PhD, we're here for you. Uh, we can help you study smarter and more efficiently so that you do have time to socialize and do other activities. Uh, there are writing specialists here in the library and writing peers that can make sure you're writing at the academic level that your professors are hoping to see. Uh, you can make research appointments. Uh, this is probably the thing that could save you the most time meeting with a research librarian. Uh, for some students, it can shave hours and hours and hours off of your research time. One of our most popular programs is called SLGs. Uh, it stands for Supported Learning Groups, but really, really quickly, I think every student forgets what the SLG stands for. They just know that they need to come to the SLGs. Um, uh, thousands of students attend every year. It is our most popular program. So Supported Learning Groups, our SLGs, are for traditionally difficult courses. This is where a student who did really amazing in the course is leading that course, that leading that session, that SLG, every single week. They're also attending the class with you every week. So they know what your prof ends up focusing on that week. They know what they said. Uh, they know what questions students were asking in class. So they know what's happening, what the focus is, uh, and they'll help lead you through week by week, uh, starting about the third week of class. It's also because it is a group learning, um, you also get to meet other students who really want to do well in that class. And that's where you could end up meeting a lot of your friends. Um, the SLGs start about the third week, uh, and that's just in time for making sure that you're really prepared for your first midterms. Um, all of these services and, and many more are in the library. Uh, as I mentioned right at the beginning, there's lots of places to study and hang out. Um, the individual spaces, you can just go and choose an individual space that's, that's right for you. Uh, but there also is group study space um, where you can book, book a room to study with your friends and your classmates. One of the one of the most popular things in the library is the stats and math help on the third floor uh, and you can just walk in there. Usually your your profs for your classes will post when there is somebody there available uh, so you'll know what the schedule is. Um, yeah, but no matter what you're studying, uh, we have supports for you uh, to make sure that you're getting the best experience possible. Um, I wanted to touch, oh, maybe maybe just back to that list a little bit, Jenny, sorry about that. Um, in terms of um, in terms of some of the things on the list that I have here, like with creating your study schedule, um, I did want to say that, you know, one of the tips is to make sure that you have put in your social time, like block it off. If you know that Thursday nights or you learn after a few weeks of being here that Thursday nights is going to be a night where you're uh, booked, just book that into your schedule and make sure that that social time is there. Because like as Josh mentioned, I think Shelly in too, like there's other things going on that we need to do to take care of ourselves. And that social time is part of it. And it is part of uh, um, what's going to make university a really great place for you. Uh, 
I wanted to share some things that students have said uh, in learning appointments. So uh, I don't know if you can see behind me. If you can, this is the office. This is where I meet with students at that desk right over there. Um, and, you know, Shelly, I mentioned too, we're here for you. We want to help. Um, so I'm going to share some of the things students have said to me. Um, the first two are things that Shelly Ann mentioned. So one of them was about critical thinking. So I do have students that come in and say, what is critical thinking? People are talking about critical thinking. I'm told I should be doing critical thinking, but what is it and how do I do that? So we would work with you um, and provide you some, some documents to help you use your critical thinking skills, understand what it is, and make sure that when you're doing your reading, that you're reading critically so that you can write critically and answer critically on your uh, exams and, and in your papers. Another one is, I keep procrastinating. How do I stop? So especially right after orientation week, it can be hard to kind of get started and you're thinking it's just the beginning of university uh, and already I'm like struggling a little bit to make sure that I'm on top of my classes. So every week of the semester, you're, you're getting about eight to 10% of the content, right? If you're not getting really into that right at the get go, you're going to you're going to struggle maybe because it's going to feel a little overwhelming to get started. So I have students that come in and I'm like, how do I stop procrastinating? I really need to get going. And so we work on that together. Um, another question. How do you study for multiple choice tests? Many of you will have multiple choice like the whole exam or the whole test is multiple choice or part of it is multiple choice and there are ways to approach that. Uh, I'm taking chem and physics. How much time should be spent on solving the problems versus learning the theory? Uh, this is a really big one for the students that come and see me. Uh, I'll give you a hot tip. It's about 80-20. So 80% 80 80 time spent on solving the problem. 20% on the theory. And if you're trying to start with the theory, you might actually want to switch it and try to solve the problem and then go back to the textbook, back to the notes from class, and then see see where you're getting stuck and go back and forth. As Shelly had mentioned, you don't want to just go to your TA, your teaching assistant or your prof and be like, I don't know how to solve this, right? You want to be able to say to them, hey, I'm getting stuck here. Or, you know, I think I've followed all the steps, but I'm not getting the answer that's expected. You want to let them know how much you've attempted um, to focus on that um, before you go and see them. Um, uh, I read and highlight as my main study method. Why can't I remember the content in my exams? Uh, I don't know where to start. This is a really big one and it is very, very common. Uh, I study all the time, but my marks aren't great. How should I decide what's important in the textbook or in the notes from class? What am I going to spend time studying on? Uh, I study with friends, but we don't get much studying done. I'm an A student and want to be an A plus student, or I'm a C student and I want to get Bs. Uh, how do you make an academic presentation or an academic poster? How do I know what will be on the exam? And Shelly Ann mentioned your course outline. So another hot tip, a lot of that is in the course outline. So no matter what your question is, if it's about studying, learning, presenting, there is somebody in the library to help you. Um, you don't have to remember all of these details. The main thing is to come into the library. Come in. This uh, picture that's up here now is of our Ask Us desk, uh, and it is the first thing you will see when you enter the front doors of the library. We are here to answer all of your questions. The staff at the front desk are very, very helpful. Uh, either they'll answer your questions directly or they'll find you the specialist uh, that you can speak to. Uh, so we have all of this help available for you. We also have access to free books, including some textbooks. Uh, so many students do prefer to buy them and BJ is going to chat to you about that. Uh, so thanks, everybody. If you have questions for me, I'd love to answer them. And over to you, BJ. Hi everyone, oh, thank you Heather. Uh, can you hear me good, Jenny? Is the audio good? Perfect. 
Uh, hi, everyone. My name is BJ. My pronouns are she and her. And uh, I'm going into my fourth year of criminal justice and public policy. And like Josh, I'm also on the orientation team. And today I'm going to be talking about textbooks and supplies. And the first thing I will start with is that the supplies and textbooks will be specific to each course that you take at the University of Guelph. And each professor decides what textbook uh, or supplies you need for each of the courses. Uh, to determine what textbook you need, be sure to check out course link on the first day of your classes. Like Shelly Ann said, it will be in the uh, course outline or syllabus like some people call it. And uh, you can find this information there. And it will also, like I said, be posted by your professor on the first day of classes. And they will also specify what year and what uh, edition the textbook you need will be. And many students don't get their supplies or textbook before the first day of classes unless instructed by unless said by the instructor. And the professor usually does not expect you to have your textbook on the first day of class. So there's no need to like worry about it. What if I don't have my textbook or what if I fall behind? The professor does not expect you to have the textbook before the first day of class. And even if they do, they will let you know within like the next couple of weeks. And you will also receive this information. And you can purchase textbooks from many places, including the university bookstore, co-op bookstore, and from other students. I personally, in first year, got used textbooks just because the newer ones were a little bit expensive and I just didn't want to spend too much money on them. So I got used textbooks from Facebook groups and from other uh, students as well. And I found those to be very uh, helpful for me. But it also depends on what you are, like, what you study like. If you like the physical textbooks or the, the PDF copy, it, each person gets like different types of textbooks. I just, I depended on, uh, use textbooks just because the newer ones are a little bit expensive and just make sure when you're getting your textbooks get the right edition on the right year just so it's not confusing whenever your professor says oh can you open to this page and you're like oh i have completely different information on my page so just make sure if you don't know what additional year you need refer back to your course outline or just email your professor your ta and they will be able to confirm that with you and that's pretty much it if you have any questions you can put them in the chat and i can answer it but if not, Jenny, over to you. Thank you so much, BJ. That was wonderful. So like BJ mentioned, if you have questions about textbooks, um, please feel free to send us an email at start at uoguelph.ca. Um, I know this, these are questions we frequently get, so we're more than happy to help you. And I know um, when I was in my first year, I was like, I need to have everything ready to go for that first class. All my pencils, all my uh, pens, my notebooks, my laptop, all my textbooks. Uh, but don't worry, like BJ said and others, like you can have, uh, wait till your first day of class. Wait, like Shelly Ann mentioned, wait till your professor goes through the syllabus or your course outline and then really understand uh, what you need before purchasing it. Uh, we also have a list of different locations to buy textbooks on on startufg.ca. Um, but if you do want have questions about where to buy textbooks, new or used, you can also email us. Um, so I just wanted to take some time today to um, thank all of our wonderful professors for professors, presenters, um, and different campus resources for coming today to share this information with all of you. Uh, this session is recorded and will be posted on startufg.ca um, and will uh, appear there within 48 hours after the session is done. So uh, if you want to rewatch or learn some of those great uh, tips and tricks, you can do that as well. And uh, next week, we will be having a session next Tuesday on um, August 22nd, all about preparing that final checklist. So what are those last little step steps and things you need to do before you arrive uh, on campus to come and see us uh, in the first week of September? But until then, if you do have any questions, please feel free to email us, give us a call, or also follow our social media handles on the screen. Uh, we'll be doing lots of different features um, and different spreading lots of different information that could be helpful to you um, in your lead up to welcoming and coming onto campus. Uh, but thank you everyone for a wonderful session and we look forward to welcoming you all and seeing you all on the first day of classes in the fall. Bye everyone.